uh, this session of the Minnesota Senate Agriculture Broadband and Rural Development Committee for Monday, April 15th is now in session. Uh, folks, we've got a couple things to do today. We're going to talk through uh, the governor's agricultural provisions and his budget, uh, his supplemental agriculture budget. Then we're going to talk through the governor's supplemental broadband budget. Uh, and then we will present and discuss uh, Senate File 3955, which is the omnibus supplemental agricultural finance bill. Uh, so we'll start with Senate File 5365. Okay, Senator Putnam, you may begin when you are ready. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. What we have before us right now is the governor's supplemental uh, agriculture budget. Um, the folks we have here to testify about this are the ones who know everything about it. So I will just be quiet um, and listen to our dear friends from the Department of Agriculture. Good afternoon, Commissioner. Mr. <laughs> you can state your name and fire away. Mr. Chair and members, uh, Tom Peterson, uh, Commissioner for the Minnesota Department of Agriculture. And today we're going to just uh, walk through some slides that highlight the uh, key pieces in the governor's budget. It's kind of interesting because we put this budget together. I don't think we've ever uh, presented our budget in the time I've been commissioner uh, and then had our target. So it's a little different. Just remember this was written uh, uh, a while ago, and uh, but uh, all good stuff that will relate to uh, the amendment and the DE you'll see later in working uh, with the Senate and appreciate that. So with that, I'll have uh, Ms. Medina is going to walk through, you can just go to the next slide, uh, is going to walk through the slides. It's our mission. You can keep going. And we'll just go right through it. I'll just turn it over to her and she can walk through the slides and we're glad to take any questions. Great. And you can just state your name and you know what to do. Perfect. Thank you, Mr. Chair. For the record, my name is Michelle Modina, and I serve as the Director of Government Relations for the Minnesota Department of Agriculture, and I'll walk through the different budget appropriations. So the first one we have is $4 million general fund request for Agri, so this is to help support the dairy and livestock industries in the state of Minnesota. This is in fiscal year 2025. Also $3 million from general fund for nitrate treatment, so the governor recommends funding some in-home water treatment systems to remove nitrates from drinking water. This will be targeted towards those homes that have the most need, so the and also the residents that are um, at most risk, so pregnant people and children. So we'll focus on those areas, and then we can also do use the funds for education, outreach and technical assistance, and this is just one time in 2025. And then we have an AFEC sunset, so fees are collected for this, but there's no general fund request, um, general fund appropriation requested. So this just extends the AFREC, the Agricultural Fertilizer Research and Education Council, for 10 more years, or sorry, for five more years. Um, so it gives us an authority to collect the fees for on bulk fertilizer sales for five years and then also use those fees for five years as well. So as a reminder, this fee collects 40 cents per ton and would sunset at the end of fiscal year 2024. Another budget neutral item is the dairy profitability enhancement. So this one is changes to the dairy development and profitability enhancement statute to broaden the use of the funds to support dairy farmers um, to kind of keep up with the evolving needs of, of the dairy industry. So this would just expand how we can use the funds, but again, budget neutral. The hemp program guidelines, another budget neutral proposal. So we have a Minnesota hemp program is through the USDA and uh, we need to keep up with their different requirements and changes to the program. So every time they make a change, we have to update our state plan. This allows us to do that more seamlessly by not having to do rulemaking every time, but to update it through statute. Then we have the expanding farm to school and early care grant, so another budget neutral. So the governor recommends expanding the eligibility for the farm to school and early care grant program to include home-based early care providers. As we know, a lot of our early, early care providers in rural Minnesota are in home settings, so this would allow them to apply for these grant programs as well. Um, it currently only provides resources for schools and education centers for uh, local food purchases, and then again, just expands it to home-based providers. The Organic Advisory Task Force sunset date, this would extend the Advisory Task Force for another 10 years, so it extend it out to 2034. For the Farmers Market Grant Technical Changes, uh, this is, would expand the eligible uses for the appropriation that was from last year's session 
for the farmers markets infrastructure grants to support nutrition programs. So this would let them um, to expand those uses to cover costs like service fees and staff capacity. And we worked quite a bit with the Farmers Market Association and these were all changes that they were very supportive of. Then we have some rural finance authority changes. These are all budget neutral. So the first one is for the beginning farmer tax credit expansion. So this would expand the definition of an individual to an individually, individual or individually owned limited liability corporation. We know that a lot of beginning farmers create LLCs and they apply for this program with an LLC which currently is not eligible for this program. It had to be an individual applying. So this would allow those LLCs owned by an individual to apply and receive that tax credit. For the disaster loan program, this would allow the additional cost of feed to be covered as a hazard during declared droughts. And then for the maximum loan amount increases, so the governor recommends that we increase um, all of RFA's bond funded loan programs by $100,000 each. So this would include the beginning farmer loan program, the seller sponsored loan program, the agricultural improvement loan program, the livestock expansion loan program, and the restructure two loan program. And that is all the changes. Okay. Thank you. Anything else? Are we questions for the commissioner presentation? Senator Dornick. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, and I just had a question on the three million general fund request. If there's a little more details to that on uh, as far as how they're going to administer that with the costs for per residence. Do so they have a, any of those details worked out or not yet? Ms. Medina or Commissioner, I don't take it. Yeah, Mr. Chair, Senator. So we're expecting that it would cost about $2,600 per RO system per household. So with that $3 million, it would be available for over three years. We'd assume about $1 million per year. At that rate, we figure that we could do about 150 of wells at 100% cost share. So we'd pay all the $2,600. We could do 350 wells at a 50% cost share. So a total then of 500 wells we could do per year. With that funding, if we had three, if we had one million per year, Senator Dornick, thank you, sir. The follow-up just uh, talks about demonstrate financial need. Do you have a cutoff on where we're going to? Uh, yeah, what's the threshold there, Dean? Yeah, Mr. Chair and Senator. So we're looking at um, Minnesotans that are uh, at or below two hundred percent of poverty. Any other questions? Okay, seeing no more, Senator Putnam. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay, thank you. With that, uh, we will be laying uh, Senate file 5365 uh, over. And now we are on to Senate file 5366. While they are getting set up, Senator Putnam, do you have any opening comments? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Excellent timing. Uh, yes, uh, what we're about to hear is the governor's uh, supplemental uh, broadband uh, budget proposal, uh, and I'm grateful to have our friends in the Office of Broadband here to tell us all about it. Okay. You may state your name and begin your testimony. Well, good afternoon, Senators, and thank you, Chair. Um, my name is Bree Mackey, for the record, and I'm the Executive Director of the Office of Broadband Development. And today we are going to present the 2024 Broadband Supplemental Budget Proposals. Uh, so there are two items we'd like to discuss with you today, and one is the transfer authority, and the other is authorization to utilize the federal digital equity funding. Both of these are budget neutral, um, so just want to point those out to you. 
So the transfer authority um, really is asking and allowing the commissioner to transfer up to $5 million of the fiscal year's appropriations between the border to border grant program, the low population density broadband program, and the line extension program to meet the demands. And I'll share a little bit more about uh, each of those in a little bit. The next slide, just as a reminder, and I know you have seen this earlier in this session, but what is the uh, need that is still out there? And so based on our maps from uh, last fall, uh, we are still showing that 162 homes are without the access of 25.3, and 229,000 homes uh, do not have the speed goals of 2026 at 100 by 20. Uh, I do like to point out on the slide, if you look back a year ago, November of 2022, you can see that the programs that you all authorize are making a difference, but the need continues to be there. I also, oh, can we go back one second? Sorry, just two things also to point out. And again, uh, as the Committee of Jurisdiction, you are very well aware that these locations are the most expensive and the hardest to serve. And so flexibility to move where the need is and the best grant applications that come in uh, to meet those needs with match fund is what we're looking for in those transfer authorities. Uh, just again, as a reminder, we are in grant round 10 um, of the biennium appropriation that you all uh, made available last year with 50 million available in our border to border grant program and 20 in the low population density program. Official awards are hopefully to be made uh, July 1st to line up with the next biennium and state funds need to be awarded so that we can take locations off our bead final map of unserved and underserved locations that we are required to serve with the bead dollars. As a reminder, just for uh, historical information, grant round nine last year when we made our award or actually a few about a month ago, I guess. Um, we had over 69 applications. In the border to border, we had 38 applications for over $65.5 million in requests, and 31 applications in the low population for 85.8 uh, in requests. So we know that uh, the need and the requests are still out there. I also just want to point out that with those uh, awards came 49% uh, match. So 51 million in local match was also leveraged by awarding these grants. All right, so utilizing the federal capacity grant dollars. So as you recall, um, the language would, or we're in the middle, we just got approval of our digital opportunity plan by NTIA on March 26. What we're asking here is for the deed commissioner to use the federal state digital capacity grant funding from the recent announcement of notice of funding opportunity from NTIA. Minnesota has been notified that we'll tentatively receive $12 million for activities laid out in our digital opportunity plan. These funds will assist individuals and communities with the tools, the resources, opportunities, and skills they need to benefit from participating with high-speed internet. We learned in our digital opportunity plan that what matters most to Minnesota is connecting people to people, people to information, and people to resources. As a reminder, the federal funding made available is through the NTIA, so the National Telecommunications Information Administration, through the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act. Uh, we talk a lot about a BEAD, and again, BEAD is the infrastructure dollars that will go into deploying broadband across the state. The digital equity funding is what is in our digital opportunity plan, and really, again, those skills and needs of the folks uh, to be able to participate in the uh, high-speed, affordable internet world. Each program required the state to develop plans. So with the digital equity plan, you can move the slides, thank you. As a reminder, and I know this you've seen this all before, but we did receive planning dollars to develop that plan. And now we're moving into the notice of funding to be able to apply for the capacity grants to be able to do some of those um, initiatives that we identified in the plan. And so that's just a little timeline and the different areas. We can also look at applying for competitive grants when the notice of funding comes out for that as well. For Minnesota, when we went forward to uh, create a digital opportunity plan, we went across the state and had digital connection committees that were self-directed uh, and self-acknowledged, and we had over 106 digital connection committees across the state. 
We took information from all of them based on what they have identified as needs, barriers, information, resources, and then developed a plan that was not something that was formed before we went out into communities, but was really formed after gathering all of that information. We also did listening sessions across the state to develop that plan. And here's just a list of some of the example activities that came out of our plan. I do wanna state that the approved digital opportunity plan is available on our website, as well as we do have paper copies for those that would like those as well. But some of the things we did identify is to develop curriculum and administer grants to high schools and uh, two-year colleges to support the training and hiring of students in paid technician internships uh, or technical support as well as creating um, programs possibly um, for our township, cities, counties in a formula base, so not to create an equity issue for counties and local governments that have the resource to apply for those grants, but really providing digital opportunity across the state in many ways. And finally, where are we now? So again, as I stated, our approved plan is available on our website. Uh, it was accepted by NTIA on March 26. And next step is we have 60 days from March 29th to put in our application for our capacity grant request of $12 million. Um, so we do have an, up, an opportunity when we submit our capacity grants to do a little bit of update if we wish to in our digital opportunity plan. We know that we would like to add some language around uh, careers and broadband um, infrastructure uh, to help meet uh, some of the needs we are seeing and conversations we're having across the state. So with that, um, that is the presentation and happy to stand for questions. Thank you, Ms. Mackey. Uh, questions from members? Senator Westrom. Ms. Mackey, uh, can we, how much money are you looking to transfer um, to the low, low density program or from that? Can you uh, revisit that a little more? Ms. Mackey. Yes, thank you, Chair, and, and thank you, Senator, for the question. So really what that would allow us to do is up to $5 million in transfer based on the applications we would receive during this application time. So we know right now we only have that additional $50 million we'll be making awards. What we saw last time is that we had some good applications because of the threshold of only $20 million in the low population. We were either unable to fund the, the next one and have to fund a little less because we couldn't go over the 20 million and we had some applications that were very close and an extra say 300,000 or 1 million maybe would have been um, something that would have made for a good application. So just looking to transfer up to $5 million within that funding uh, cycle, um, but it varies a little bit on the applications we receive. Mr. Mr. Chair, so Ms. Mackey, uh, so, so it's just flexibility of up to five million out of the regular rural broadband dollars to the low, low popular or sparse low density program. Is that is that correct, Ms. Mackey? Yes. Again, uh, thank you, Chair and Senator Westrom. So yes, essentially. However, it could also look where maybe we have a really excellent uh, application in traditional border to border, but just not enough dollars and maybe less applications for the low population. Um, we also look at local match and we have some uh, pretty incredible uh, counties stepping up with their ARPA funding and, and some additional resources and we want to make sure we're leveraging as much local match as well. So it really would allow flexibility between those programs based on the applications. Okay. Senator so, Westrom. Mr. Chair, thank you. Uh, Ms. Mackey, uh, so, so it could go either way. You, you, you could potentially take some out of the low density uh, dollars and put them into the regular rural broadband if you had strong applications there, uh, maybe strong applications with a good more match so you could stretch the money further, uh, getting more households. And so am I understanding that right? You're, you're gonna make that kind of be nimble to make the best financial decision, the best number of homes we can reach with the with the fewest dollars, if you will. Ms. Mackey. Um, thank you, Chair, and thank you, Senator. So yes, it's allowing that flexibility because the last thing um, we want to do is not fund an application that really is solid and meets um, all of the goals, the requirements, and ultimately um, 
you know, affecting the most people uh, with the resources that we have. Okay. Senator Kunish. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Ms. Mackey. Um, can you tell us approximately, like, where is the greatest need? Where, where is the least, uh, what area has the least access to, to broadband, whether business-wise or is it, is it this map? And I'm sorry, it's just a little small for me to see here. Sure. Is it the pink? Ms. Mackey. Uh, yes, thank you, Chair. Thank you, Senator. Yes, this map is very tiny, and I apologize for that. But yes, the red areas are locations that have the under 25 by 3. And we are more than happy to put together specific maps based on district if that is helpful to you. Um, but yeah, we have a very interactive map uh, on our website. And so again, just apologize. I know it's very small. No sure. problem there. Well, Senator Kulish. So is there any, um, does, does Minnesota work with any of its neighboring states that we border? Um, are there federal dollars that go, you know, that are interstate um, broadband access? Do we partner with any of our, our neighbors, not Canada, but the rest of them, uh, just to, you know, use those dollars the very best, with those federal dollars especially? Ms. Mackey. Yes, thank you, Chair, and thank you, Senator. I think that's an excellent question. I think, you know, just remember that our broadband grants go to internet service providers, um, and so they're really the ones that are developing the plan and working with each state individual. However, we, especially with the bead dollars, um, are finding ourselves working very closely with all of the states. Um, understanding best practices, what's working for them, you know, how can, how can we learn from each other? Um, and so as far as dollars itself, the USDA may do some of that, uh, especially, especially when we're working with our, our tribal partners, when it's the jurisdiction is a little bit uh, partnering a little bit more. But ultimately, you know, the state dollars are the state dollars and we rely on our internet service providers to put those applications in for Minnesotans. Thank you. Any other member questions? If not, thank you for your presentation. Any closing comments, Senator Putnam? Thanks, Mr. Chair. You are welcome. And we will be... So we're laying this bill over, and then uh, this brings us to Senate File 3955, which is the Omnibus Supplemental Agriculture Finance Bill. And just as a reminder, uh, we are just doing a walkthrough today, and then uh, we will do member discussion and amendments on Wednesday. But we do have testimony today. So, so to that, Senator Putnam, would you like to start us out? Thank you very much, Mr. Chair and members. Uh, I just am going to say a few things very briefly, and then we'll turn it over to uh, Ms. Painter to, to walk it through, and also to Mr. Olofsson to talk about how much everything costs. And then we have a couple testifiers here who are here to say great things about the bill. I hope. Uh, members, this bill is, uh, I think, remarkably balanced. If I had to pick one word to describe our approach to our supplemental budget this session, I would use that word, balanced. It's balanced between immediate pressing acute concerns and the long-term vitality of Minnesota's agriculture that is our responsibility to grow. Uh, it's balanced between dairy, corn, soy, uh, big producers and small producers. There's something in this bill for everyone in Minnesota agriculture. Um, and there are a couple in particular uh, initiatives that I'm especially proud of. Uh, of course, one of them has to be turkey lasers. Uh, I'm very glad that we are going to be um, thinking about the long-term health of Minnesota by uh, doing the appropriate uh, move, which is to anticipate a problem before it happens and take care of it before it occurs, uh, which is one of the things that our turkey laser initiative will do. Also, in terms of investment in the future, in terms of workforce, we have Senator Dornick's bill for meat packing, uh, meat cutting, uh, getting more people into that industry uh, is another thing that I think is an essential dimension of this bill. But ultimately, one of the issues that we're probably going to talk the most about is the nitrate concern in the Karst region, and I'm especially proud of how we've approached that. Uh, given the resources that we were given, we uh, were tasked to dedicate some of those resources to the Department of uh, uh, Health who will take care of some of those concerns. But we also took some leftover, the rest of our money, and we uh, articulated it to those uh, folks with wells who are in the greatest need. So the $750,000 for um, uh, nitrate remediation in the karst land uh, is going to be dedicated to folks who make less than 300% of the federal poverty level. 
folks who have the greatest needs will get the help we want to give them. Uh, but there's something else that we're doing, uh, which uh, again is something I'm particularly proud of, and that's our investment in soil health. And instead of just adding to the soil health program, which is already oversubscribed, we've decided to dedicate those resources to those who want to do uh, soil health practices in the karst region specifically. So all told, we're putting $3.25 million towards this pressing concern that is directly in front of us, but we're doing so in a responsible way that will help people uh, do new practices so that this problem that we've got right now will not still be a problem in 20 more years. Uh, so, uh, Mr. Chair, members, um, I'm very proud of this bill and eager to talk about it. Um. Great. Thank you, Senator Putnam. Uh, so with that, we will uh, turn, I think, first to Ms. Nir Olson, who will do a walkthrough of the financial side of it. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. In your packets, you should have a spreadsheet uh, with a date and time of 4-13-2024, 10.52 a.m. in the top right corner. And this is, uh, summarizes, primarily summarizes Article 1 within the Senate File 3955 DE Amendment. So just to give you a basis, uh, so the Ag Committee received the target for the 24-25 biennium from the general fund of uh, $4,545,000 and, and the tails of $2,576,000. Um, this bill in front of you meets those general fund targets. So call, in the spreadsheet in front of you, column A discusses the different appropriation items, and then columns F through K uh, summarizes the Senate position before you. So starting with the Department of Agriculture, on line eight of the spreadsheet for nitrate treatment, uh, specifically for reverse osmosis systems in southeastern Minnesota counties with priority given to households up to 300% of the federal poverty guidelines and for households with infants and pregnant individuals. There's $750,000 um, one-time funding in FY 2025 uh, with a extended availability through FY 27. On line nine, for soil health equipment grants specified in south southeastern Minnesota counties, that's $500,000 one time in FY25, again with extended availability. On line 10, for there's an increase to the elk depredation payments. Uh, this modifies chapter 43 from last year of additional $75,000 from the general fund. On line 11, for survey day abatement and uh, this is for a report on survey day abatement and, and crop and fence damage. Uh, so it's $50,000 one time in FY 2024 with availability through fiscal year 25 to get that report done. Uh, moving on to promotion and marketing within MDA, uh, there's a modification to the uh, dairy development and profitability teams. This actually happens in a later article, but the appropriation is within um, uh, Article 1, so but that's a budget neutral item. Uh, there's tech, on line 15, there, another budget neutral item is technical changes to the farmer's market grants. Uh, this comes from Senate File 3404. Uh, on line 16, um, at, following the governor's budget language in Senate File 5635, uh, there's a tails increase um, for maintaining current service levels of $20,000 uh, in fiscal year 2026 and $20,000 in fiscal year 2027. There's a corresponding decrease that I'll mention in the administration and financial assistance um, division at MDA. Um, moving on down to line 19, that's the budget neutral item for the farm to school program to also include early care providers, that expansion, which is budget neutral. On line 20, uh, this is a one-time increase to farm to school of $100,000 from the general fund in fiscal year 25. If those funds are not uh, fully utilized by the end of fiscal year 25, they can be used for other purposes under AGRI. Um, on line 21, this is the additions to uh, AGRI's undesignated funding. So there's an additional $345,000 in fiscal year 25, and then an additional $1.288 million each fiscal year in the tails for a total of $2.576 million from the general fund to go towards undesignated funding within AGRI 
So that's the entirety of the, tar uh, the tails target goes towards that purpose. On line 22, there's the dairy cancellation in fiscal year 2024. This is due to us canceling uh, the agri program in FY25 and then reappropriating it all with extended availability. Uh, that gives MDA additional flexibility. So on line 23, you can see uh, dairy with an I program is reappropriated with extended availability. That $4 million is reappropriated on line 23. Line 24 shows the cancellation of the 23.107 million uh, from Agri in FY25, but on line 25, it's reappropriated uh, for the same purposes with extended availability uh, of that same 23.107 million from the general fund. On line 26, this is the livestock protection grant specified for avian influenza. Uh, one-time appropriation of $300,000 in FY25 with extended availability. On line 27, uh, this is $375,000 in FY24 for the meat processing as education grants. This is Senator Dornick's Senate file 4069 with the only alteration is that it's now within the AGRI program. Um, on line 28, this is, these are the, these are the items that we are now designated funding within EGRIT for wild rice natural stands of $200,000 uh, each fiscal year beginning in fiscal year 25. This was already within the EGRIT appropriation, but now it's being designated, so it's not adding to the general fund target. Again, on line 29, um, this is the, for the wild rice forward selection part of EGRIT. There's $250,000 ongoing designated towards that purpose from the general fund beginning, uh, in, beginning in fiscal year 2025. So again, it's designating funds that are already within the GREET program. Um, on line 32, this is the budget neutral item, but that just summarizes the down payment assistance uh, modification to now being for farmers experiencing limited land access. Uh, on line 33, uh, for an agricultural land trends report, this comes from Senate file 3913. It's $50,000 one-time funding in FY24 with availability for the second year to finish the report. On line 34, this is that corresponding maintaining current service levels tails reduction of uh, $20,000 reduction in FY26 and FY27 each year. So moving on to page two, just to summarize all of the Department of Ag, <clears throat> you can see for the 24-25 biennium, there's 2.5, a net uh, additional spending from the general fund of $2.545 million in the 24-25 biennium and $2.576 million in the 26-27 biennium. Moving on down to line 55 for the Department of Health, there's an additional $2 million one time in FY25 uh, with extended availability uh, specifically to address nitrate contamination in private wells in southeastern Minnesota counties. So, to full, uh, so on line 66, you can see the general fund appropriation that meets our targets of $4.545 million in the 24-25 biennium and $2.576 million in the 26-27 biennium. Uh, just moving on to non-general fund uh, expenditures, I, there's a typo on this spreadsheet and I will update the spreadsheet for Wednesday's committee, but the amounts for the AFREC uh, extension on line 74 uh, through the bottom should be 1270000 not 1240000 So I apologize for that typo and it will be corrected. Um, but so for additional expenditures for, for AFREC, it should be 2 million, uh, it's 1,270,000 in additional from the AG fund uh, in, in the 26, uh, beginning in FY26 with the extension. So for a total of 2,540,000 for the 26, 27 biennium. And then moving on down to line 80, again, it should be 1 million uh, $270,000 uh, of additional revenue for AFREC 
beginning in FY25 and ongoing. So it should be 1,270,000 uh, of net savings on line 83 um, in the 24-25 biennium. And then the expenditures and revenues for the AFREC extension cancel out in the 26-27 biennium. And with that, I would be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. Olofsson. And while we are doing a discussion and amendments on Wednesday, if you, anybody members have any specific questions uh, on the part we just heard, we can certainly entertain those now. And if not, we will move on to Ms. Painter. Mr. Oh, sir, Senator Westrom. Um, Mr. Chair, uh, the expenditure, I think probably you, Mr. Uh, Senator Chair Putnam, the expenditure on the, the RO systems, uh, one of the testifiers talked about $2,600. Are they all going to be a match? So each applicant would put, put up some money, and it seems like $2,600 is, is higher price than most RO systems out there. Are, are these special, unique? Do they do other things than that other RO systems don't do. Um, can you talk about that just a little bit more or one of the testifiers? Senator Putnam. Mr. Chair, Senator Westrom, it's an excellent question. I'll, I'll uh, sort of explain to the best of my ability, which is meager. So there's a good chance that we might have to ask someone else to come up here and explain a little bit better. Um, but my understanding is one, within that $2,600 is a year's worth of maintenance and upkeep. Uh, so that might be a part of that additional expense. Um, also that um, hopefully the program will be tiered to a certain extent in that it will be means tested and that there will be matching for folks at a certain uh, level of income uh, and different matching for folks uh, at different levels of income. Um, that's my understanding, but perhaps uh, uh, our friends from MDA, maybe Ms. Medina would like to explain that and correct all the stuff that I just said. Sure, absolutely. Commissioner Peters. Mr. Chair and Senator Westrom, uh, you know, and just looking at the language too and everything, um, you know, we, we would look at this, you know, I think too, I think in looking at this, you know, and kind of a new thing too and not knowing exactly what we're, uh, you know, uh, what the need is going to be and, and how this is going to go, we're going to, you know, we'll, we'll continue to look at this. Right now we're putting out a pilot program ourselves in the department, we're just uh, kind of formulating that with a, a half a million dollars that we put together within our own budget for this year. And so this would, you know, go on top of that. So we're looking at, um, as the bill says, up to 300%. We could do up to 100%, but at a lower level, we would probably do uh, a cost share or something uh, on applicants like that, if that makes sense. Senator Westrom. And Mr. Chair, uh, Commissioner Peterson, uh, do you anticipate uh, getting a quantity contract uh, or would they just be reimbursed by any local RO dealer uh, wherever the consumer buys them or would there be kind of a set fee do you anticipate? Uh, and, and do these systems have anything more unique than what, what an RO, you know, Culligan or uh, I don't know, some of the other brands uh, that are out there? Do, do they, they all do the same kind of effect? Mr. Peterson. Mr. Chair, and, uh, and you know, 2,600, the, the RO systems vary. I, I, I myself, Mr. Chair and Senator Westrom, I've met with the well, the well drillers actually do also put in well. Most of them do uh, RO systems and met with them, and they said, you, as you're kind of saying, there's different uh, uh, varieties and things like that, but they, they really do, <clears throat> by the way, uh, you know, they say we'll take care of the issue uh, too as well. But I also have uh, Ms. Wagner uh, here and she can uh, provide, she's been working on this issue and she can provide more uh, background on the RO systems. A little bit, Mr. Chair, Mr. Commissioner, that, that'd be helpful. I mean, I just, I assume you're, that's kind of what you're digging into, but mm -hmm. it would be helpful to know on uh, 
want to make sure we're getting the best bang for the buck and spreading it to the most farms or property owners uh, affected as, as we can if we're doing this. So, Ms. Wagner, do you want to just state your full name and then you can go? Yeah. Mr. Chair, members of the committee, my name is Margaret Wagner, and I'm the manager of the fertilizer and on point section at the Minnesota Department of Agriculture. Um, Senator Westrom, to answer your questions, um, there is some variability in the price, but we're using information um, through pilot programs that have occurred in southeast Minnesota through the TAP In initiative. So, similarly, working through a uh, a local partner like Olmstead County to help administer this program. So their experience is generally $2,500 for um, those systems with installation, then as mentioned, a year of maintenance on top of that. So um, what we know is if the cost comes in lower than that, then we would be able to buy additional systems through the program. But this is our initial estimate based on um, purchasing and installing these systems in, in that general region. And um, right now we've identified 100% cost share for demonstrated uh, economic needs. So those, um, um, those households that fit that criteria. And um, from there, we would scale back that cost share looking at um, some type of match. So it may be 50-50. Um, and those are the types of details we're working out. And as we put together those estimates, we kind of um, scale. We can obviously purchase more and install more systems um, if we are providing less of the upfront cost. And then as far as batching, um, we will again want to partner with local, uh, through a joint powers agreement or another mechanism with a local partner to help deliver this. And we will be working then through professional plumbers for the installation. So yeah, I think there are opportunities to have those discussions and think about installing multiple systems in this geographic area. Yep. Senator Westrom. Uh, thank you, Ms. Uh, Mr. Chair and uh, Ms. Wagner, thank you. That, yep. That's all for now. Okay, seeing no other questions, we will move on to uh, Ms. Painter for the technical walkthrough. Mr. Chair and members, I'll just quickly walk you through Articles 2 and 3. Article 2 is Agriculture Policy. Section 1 amends the Beginning Farmer Equipment and Infrastructure Grant Program to give preference to farmers experiencing limited land access. This is from Senator Putnam, Senate File 5049. Section two expands eligibility for sustainable agriculture demonstration grants to add certain organizations. This is from Senate file 5125, Senator Kunesh's bill. Section three amends the farm down payment assistance grant definitions. Um, the definition of eligible farmer would add a requirement that a farmer has at least three years of experience farming. And in this section, there's also definitions added for incubator farm and limited land access. This is all from Senate file 5049 from Senator Putnam. Section four amends the reporting requirements for the farm down payment assistance grants. Again, that's from Senate file 5049. Sections five through eight are the extension of the Minnesota Agricultural Fertilizer Research and Education Council until June 30th, 2035. This is from Senate file 3719, Senator, from Senator Putnam. Section nine removes some obsolete language. This is from Senator Gustafson, Senate file 4187. Section 10 extends the Minnesota Organic Advisory Task Force to 2034. This is from Senate file 5365 from Senator Putnam. Section 11 makes some changes to the Dairy Development and Profitability Enhancement Program to allow more flexibility in the program delivery. This is also from Senate File 5365 from Senator Putnam. Section 12 adds a reference to the limited land access definition and the beginning farmer tax credit definition. This is from Senate File 5365 and also Senate File 5049, both of them from Senator Putnam. Sections 13 through 15 uh, make some changes to the beginning farmer tax credit program. These are all from Senate file 5049. Section 16 amends the disaster recovery loans to allow them to be used to purchase feed during a drought. It's from Senate file 5365, Senator Putnam's bill. And section 17 repeals the beverage inspection account. This is Senator Gustafson, Senate file 4187. And then article three uh, relates to broadband. 
And both of these sections are from Senate File 5366, which we heard today from Senator Putnam. Section one allows the commissioner to transfer up to $5 million between three different programs. And section two requires the commissioner to apply for federal grant um, and use the money for the purposes in the, the Minnesota Digital Opportunity Plan. Thank you, Ms. Painter. And uh, with that, we should have some uh, testifiers who would like to uh, come up, if unless there are any other questions from Ms. Painter. Seeing none, uh, then we will go to uh, first on my list is Alex Trinnell. And you may state your name and begin when you are ready. All right, Mr. Chair, members of the committee, my name is Alex Trinnell, and I serve as the public policy manager at the Minnesota Corn Growers Association. Uh, we appreciate Chair Putnam bringing the DE3 for SF 3955 forward um, and addressing specific needs in response to the EPA petition related to nitrates in southeast Minnesota. Uh, MCGA is committed to addressing nitrogen challenges in southeast and other vulnerable groundwater areas through partnerships, research, policy, and best management practice adoption. We support the funding to MDA to help provide clean drinking water to those with private wells that have tested for high levels of nitrates. We also wanna thank the committee for looking at existing programs to uh, address nitrates in Southeast where the karst geology is particularly susceptible to nitrate contamination. Uh, the Soil Health Financial Assistance Program has strong support by Minnesota farmers, and that is demonstrated by the overwhelming number of applications that the program has received the last two years, with demand far outpacing available funds, and has shown how interested Minnesota farmers are in exploring and implementing practices to improve soil health. The $500,000 appropriation targeted at Southeast Minnesota and the flexibility of the types of projects that are eligible to apply will allow the department to award grants to farmers to implement practices that will improve soil and water and begin to address nitrate levels in drinking water. Finally, we'd also like to express our support for the extension of AFREC to allow farmers farmer-funded research um, that gives Minnesota farmers up-to-date, scientifically reviewed information to help optimize nutrient use. Um, and this research is also a valuable tool as we look to um, address nitrates um, in the state. Uh, once again, we want to thank Chair Putnam for bringing this amendment forward, um, and given the target and the parameters that the committee was working under, the amendment goes a long way toward addressing the EPA petition um, and help the agencies implement the work plan that they've developed. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Trinnell. Next up, uh, Gary Wardish. And you can state your name and fire away. All right. Thank you, Chair Kupek and members of the committee. For the record, my name is Gary Wardish, and I'm president of the Minnesota Farmers Union. <clears throat> On behalf of our grassroots membership across the state, I'm glad to share our strong support for, your, for Senator Putman and the committees for your supplemental budget proposal and to thank you and your team for your hard work in crafting it. One of Chair Putman's strengths and the strength of this committee is that you listen directly to farmers. And we see that reflected in, in, in this proposal. In reviewing it, I can't help but think about the listening session Chair Putman attended in uh, Zambroda before a session. There were well over 100 farmers there of all different sizes and production types. And for probably two hours, he took comments and feedback on what they had hoped would inform your work. And now at a limited budget target, you've addressed many of the issues farmers raised that day. I'll talk about a couple that are particularly important to Farmers Union, and we have a longer letter that it's included in your packet. First, thank you for addressing the shortfall in Agri. That program is a cornerstone of our Department of Agriculture and a big reason other states look to us as a leader. Importantly, those under, undesignated funds that you replenish in this bill allow MDA to respond quickly to challenges like when the, meat, like when the large packing plants shut down during COVID. Second, we, have, we support your approach to, list, to addressing nitrates in southeast Minnesota and share this committee's interest in ensuring that every Minnesotan has access to safe drinking water. Investing in, re, in the reverse of osmosis systems and upgrading substandard wells, along with helping farmers make investments in soil health equipment, 
reflect the two prongs of the state's response to this issue and will supplement funds made available through the Clean Water Fund. We look forward to continuing to partner with you on this. Third, and because it's something that I've been spending a lot of time and Farmers Union has personally, is thank you for reinvesting in grants to help K-12 schools teach meat cutting. Minnesota Farmers Union just celebrated the delivery of two meat processing modules to the Central Lakes College to help them continue to build their college program. This initiative will help train the next generation of meat cutters, creating a pipeline to these programs and ensuring the future of an industry our members rely on. There is, of course, lots more to discuss, which is outlined in our letter. And I want to thank you to this committee, to Chair Putman, and to this committee for your partnership at MFU and others in crafting it. But all in all, this is a good bill, and I'm glad Farmers Union led their, lend our support of this bill. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Wordish. Uh, next up is Lauren Dower from the Minnesota Farm Bureau. Uh, and, chair, oh. yeah, go ahead. You can state your name and go away. You know, you know the drill. <laughs> Absolutely. Chair uh, Kupek and members of the committee, uh, my name is Lauren Dower. I'm the public policy specialist for the Minnesota Farm Bureau Federation um, uh, and have the privilege of representing over 30,000 farmer and rancher members across the state. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity to testify in support of Senate File 3955 with the DE amendment. Uh, I wanted to take this time to thank uh, the author and each of you, uh, or committee members here, uh, for your hard work and continued support for our farmers as well as the larger agricultural community. There are several provisions in this bill we support and I would like to briefly highlight a few. Uh, first, we appreciate the consistent funding allocated to the Department of Agriculture for the Agri program. We know this program plays a vital role uh, in encouraging growth opportunities for the agriculture and renewable fuels industries. Thank you for including funds specifically for the Animal Health Protection Grants, or turkey lasers, uh, farm school programs, as well as uh, meat cutting and processing uh, education grants. And for understanding the importance of having our younger generation understand um, where their food comes from. We definitely appreciate that. We're so, we support the effect, uh, excuse me, <laughs> we support the efforts of the Dairy Profitability and Enhancement Program and believe the new language in this bill will provide better and flexible access to dairy farmers who are transitioning or adding value to their products. We commend the committee's efforts towards soil health and water quality. As we look towards increasing participation in soil health, we thank you for investing more into the Soil Health Financial Assistance Grant, which allows farmers access to technology and equipment that helps them use practices that make sense on their farms. We are also grateful for the reauthorization of AFRAC and its commitment to better understanding how fertilizer is utilized and what best management practices assist us in reducing nitrate runoff into our groundwater. The council is a clear sign of strong collaboration in the agriculture community and, it's, and it is critical to our members who wish to improve their soils, clean water, and have economic vitality in their futures. Farmers have and always will continue to be a part of the solution. Again, we are, thank you, we are thankful for the author and the committee's hard work on this bill and, and support it getting across the finish line. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. Thanks, thank you, Mr. Dower. And with that, we have one more testifier uh, to come up, which is Commissioner Tom Peterson. <laughs> Whenever you are ready. Mr. Chairman and members, Tom Peterson, Commissioner for the Minnesota Department of Agriculture, and just appreciate the opportunity to uh, comment on this. And again, it's really an interesting and uh, unique to uh, be here with uh, targets and a set amount of dollars to work for, but with the limited dollars and budget, the department was really pleased to see dollars uh, put towards the nitrate initiative. And then what the uh, Senate did with this bill, or Chair Putnam, uh, you know, uh, working with us with the RO systems. And again, I think that we can really build on our pilot, kind of see what the need is. And then when we come back next year, we can uh, continue to build upon that and look at that. But it also helps us work, as Mr. Turnell said, uh, getting to our, uh, addressing our EPA work plan uh, in moving that out. But also uh, the soil health equipment grants, I think that's been a wildly successful program. But then taking it uh, for this 
uh, amount of dollars and targeting into those eight counties, I think will be really impactful, but it also will help us statewide. Things that we're learning, uh, building upon there what's working are things that we can take out uh, and move uh, uh, again uh, across the state. Um, I'd also like to say the, uh, the um, agri is also a really important piece that we've heard about and we really worked really hard last year. And so, uh, you know, and took a, um, you know, took a hit in there. Uh, and so any dollars that we can put back into there, and I really like what the Senate did uh, uh, working on, uh, we, you know, we joke a lot about turkey lasers, but it is really important work, you know, having a foreign animal disease such as high path, and now we can see what it's uh, done with uh, dairy cattle and, and goats and, uh, you know, but uh, the Secretary uh, Vilsack was here last week and, you know, I was proud to be able to say that we've taken steps to uh, mitigate, you know, and we're one of the only states then that has done something on the front end. And so this helps us build that out and uh, continues that and also uh, gives us also, there's some dollars there for some extra flexibility uh, in agri, I think we would look at dairy and livestock or different things that we would work to use those uh, extra dollars uh, and flexibility in there. Also the meat cutting uh, uh, piece for secondary schools that uh, Senator Dornick uh, uh, worked on, uh, that, that's a really impactful piece. When you look back at what uh, Mr. Wordish was just saying about the secondary schools, I think that uh, during our time here, uh, we'll look at uh, what we did for the meat uh, industry in Minnesota on the small end. We have a lot of grants and everything, but we looked at, we also needed butchers, you know, and so Minnesota really stands out across the nation because not only did we build, we build out our post-secondary like they were talking about at Central Lakes and at Ridge, uh, Ridgewater uh, with having classes there, we've also done and started to help support classes in secondary schools. And it's really exciting to see uh, I think it's uh, West Central Area Schools in Senator Westrom's district. I got delivery of their tra trailer uh, last week. That is really neat if you haven't seen that. But the other work that those high schools are doing are uh, very, uh, very good. And so that's a real positive uh, piece that, again, gets to the root of the problem and really helps uh, grow uh, our, our, uh, our industry there that we need to do so much. Uh, finally, um, I'd also just mention uh, AFRAC, a uh, very important piece, uh, uh, you know, as also as that we've seen, uh, I was here when it uh, passed years and years ago and we talked about it, but to see the uh, work going on and the support it has within the industry, I um, appreciate the uh, continued support for that. So with that, Mr. Chair, uh, I uh, just want to thank the work of uh, Senator Putnam and, and, uh, and the committee and we look forward to working with you as we go through this process, thank you. Okay, thank you, Commissioner Peterson. So a uh, reminder, we will do uh, member discussion and amendments uh, for this bill on Wednesday, but if there are any specific questions for one of the testifiers that was here this afternoon, um, we could do that. Senator Westrom. Mr. Chair, uh, Commissioner Peterson, the dairy with an eye rolling those dollars over. Can you explain that a little bit more? And if you've already explained it before I got back in here, um, I can talk to you offline. And I believe we are we are going to have uh, Mr. Huguenin explain that. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair and members and Senator Westrom. So my name is Paul Huguenin. I'm the director of the Ag Marketing Development Division at the Department of Agriculture. Uh, to your question about dairy with an eye, Senator. Um, so because we don't have the full-fledged farm bill yet with a five-year option for, for dairy farmers to sign up for, uh, you know, in talking with industry, et cetera, it makes sense to, to hold off and hope that we get a full farm bill so that we can incentivize farmers to sign up for more than one year um, at a time. So that's the reason for, for allowing that additional time to have those dollars available. Senator Westrom. Mr. Chair, uh, it's the same dollars. It's just there's been some uncertainty or without a f new fi farm bill, you can't get the five-year plan now. Is that the the deal and and you're going to kind of move ahead with the current landscape as much as you can 
Mr. Hugan. Yeah, Mr. Chair, Senator Westrom. So the what the what's available right now is simply just a one year option for dairy farmers to sign up for dairy margin coverage. Um, and industry folks would prefer that we hold off, be able to use that four million dollars to incentivize longer term signups. And, and you're correct; it's the exact same dollar amount. It's just allowing us a longer window to invest that uh, with dairy farmers as they sign up. Okay. Anybody else? If not, uh, Senator Putnam, uh, would you like to make some closing remarks and tell us where we're headed on Wednesday? Uh, Mr. Chair, sir, thank you. thanks for the uh, uh, indulgence today. I do want to take an opportunity now, so I don't forget to do it later, to thank everybody uh, who has been involved in this process this session. Um, you know, I want to uh, thank Ms. Painter and Mr. Olofsson for always being incredibly skilled, but also very kind. Uh, and um, uh, Ms. Peterson and Mr. Larson for your work um, uh, researching for this committee. Uh, thank you for your hard work, too. And of course, Hunter and Nick and the artist formerly known as Jackie, uh, all of you have been incredibly helpful in making us do what we do. And our great pals in Pageland, uh, you guys are awesome too. Uh, I think what our work together illustrates is that we work well when we work together and that Minnesotans and Minnesotan farmers deserve our excellence, deserve our dedication in our industry that we have shown this session and is manifest in this bill. So, thanks. Okay. And if there's nothing further, then uh, we are adjourned until well, there is something further. No, there's nothing further. Okay. In that case, we are adjourned till Wednesday.